Just to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet, particularly in Australia, and I pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging, and indeed any Indigenous people we have joining this webinar. It is great to have you join us. We pay our respects to them for their care of the land. Hi, I'm Associate Professor Phil Connors from the Centre for Humanitarian Leadership. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, to the first, this, the first webinar in our series, No Safe Space, Crisis Response in COVID-19, which has been developed in collaboration between the Centre, Australian Council for International Development and the Humanitarian Advisory Group. Before we go on, I'd just like to say we do encourage um, so the use of social media and all of this, it would be great to have you all do that. And it is the hashtag is hashtag COVID no safe space. And it is all it can all be lowercase, no spaces, just co hashtag COVID no safe space. Please get on and Twitter away. That would be great. This series of webinars will comprise one webinar per month for the next four months and will bring together individuals from across the humanitarian system to share their experiences of the COVID-19 crisis. Together, speakers and participants will identify issues arising from this unprecedented situation and examine how the challenges and opportunities presented by COVID have and will continue to change how we all work, both during the current crisis and into the future. We're very proud to be co-hosting this event, COVID-19 and localization, shifting the power or only shifting the risk. You might notice that, that that title has changed a little bit from the original because we've added in the only. And the discussion was that the risk has, in many ways has already been shifted. So it's about the shifting of the power. With us today, and I'm very pleased to have these fantastic speakers with us today, First of all, Degan Ali, Executive Director at Adesso, based in Kenya. We also have our colleagues from the Sajaja Network in Indonesia, Dr. Puji Pujiono, Senior Advisor for the Pujiono Center in Indonesia. We have Dino Ajianto from Oxfam, Indonesia. Thank you. And we were to have Ama Hussain from MDMC Indonesia, but I'm sorry that Amar is not able to join us due to a, an urgent family health issue. So we wish Amar well in that and her family well in that. So Amar is not able to join us. And then we have Siali Elolahia, um, Executive Director at the Pacific Island Association of NGOs, Piango, based in Fiji. I'm delighted, absolutely delighted and uh, as I'm sure we all are, and looking forward to hearing from this eminent group of humanitarian leaders, and we appreciate them for taking time from their busy schedules to join us. So first of all, I have great pleasure in introducing Degan Ali. I met Degan a couple of years ago, or uh, well, last year, and, and have been in touch on a regular basis. Degan is very well known throughout the system throughout the humanitarian system and is currently based in Nairobi where it is relatively early in the morning for, for Degan. Degan is, a, is the executive director at Adesso and is a staunch advocate of effective and equitable humanitarian action. With more than 20 years experience in the humanitarian and development field, Degan is transforming the aid system to give more power and voice to local communities and civil society organisations. Degan innovates new solutions that will shift power and resources, including co-founding the, the Network for Empowered Aid Response, the NIA network. Indeed, The Guardian named Degan as one of the top 10 humanitarians to follow on social media, which I most certainly do, and that is great. So Degan, I've got a question for you. What are your reflections on COVID-19 and how this has impacted on localization and leadership in Kenya, where you are based, but also in Somalia, where Odesso is active? Please. 
thank you, Phil. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Bismillah. So I think um, just some observations from my end. I've, as you know, I've been involved in the whole localization or shifting the power debate now for over five years. And, uh, and um, we made a lot of progress and achievements and we were extremely hopeful in 2016 with the grand bargain commitments. Um, but the reality is, is that we haven't been really seeing any major um, systemic changes. Um, localization really has been have become almost rhetoric and rather than being um, any, any systems issues. We're not seeing more flow of financing directly to local organizations. We're not seeing any kind of flipping of the power structure um, in terms of decision making and how the entities like the IAC are structured. We're really not um, seeing any changes at the country levels in terms of how the HCTs are structured and the cluster uh, teams. So it's, um, it's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of nice aspirational um, uh, language, but no real action and substantive systems change. Um, so COVID happened, um, the situation is fast changing. Um, our understanding of what to do and how to respond is constantly changing almost on a weekly basis. Um, but the reality is a couple of things. One, there's almost no INGO and UN agency presence on the ground. Everybody has been evacuated because of duty of care concerns. And national staff in country have been asked to mostly stay at home. So what does that mean in a situation like that? It really means that um, it's really left to civil society and civil servants if there is a large civil servants infrastructure in Somalia doesn't have one. So really left to civil society to pick up the uh, real, the, the, do the heavy lifting in terms of response and in terms of analysis and information of what's happening. It also means that decision making is really slow and response is delayed because while we have the ideas, while we have the solutions of civil society, while we have the analysis and the context and the understanding, in terms of decision making and influencing the response, we're still very much dependent on a UN-led international-led uh, system and framework that we have to work under. And that system is still very slow um, in decision-making, uh, primarily, I think, um, um, contributed by you know, the fact that many, their analysis and their, their expatriates and internationals are not on the ground. Um, so that's another consequence of the situation. Um, and then I think for us, one of the biggest concerns right now with COVID really is that we are seeing a situation in Somalia. And I would characterize and say generally Africa where European how to respond to basically bought lock, stock and barrel by our national governments and being imposed in communities that have a different demographics. 70, over 70% 70 of the population in Somalia are young people. Um, Somalis already have extreme, extreme vulnerabilities. We're talking about the only country in modern history that has had two famines that's coming out of 30 years of conflict. We're talking about high levels of refugees and IDP population. We're talking about a country that has almost no water and sanitation infrastructure in place. Um, we're talking about a place where, you know, behavioral change and attitudes and the stigmas associated with things like COVID are extreme, extremely high. Um, we're talking about uh, security challenges and, you know, remote management and access issues. Um, and so, and then of course, increase uh, existing vulnerabilities with locust crisis and uh, already high levels of food insecurity. So when you put all of those things together, layer after layer after layer, COVID just becomes, in my opinion, one of the just the triggers for a massive um, economic downturn that is affecting the entire economy. And this both applies both to both Kenya and Somalia, um, and I'm sure to many other countries in Africa and of course in the global south, um, that's going to have a negative um, impact on food security. Um, 
poor people in Kenya were saying, uh, primarily those who are living in the slums, working, um, earning their daily bread, basically going out to earn every day what they would eat and what their kids would eat, were basically saying COVID may kill us, but um, we know hunger will kill us. We're not sure if COVID will kill us, but we know hunger will kill us. And so right now we're seeing, um, really we're very concerned about the uh, potential negative impacts of COVID on, on hunger and um, potentially a famine, um, at least in the Somalia context. So as, as uh, Somali civil society, we formed actually uh, a, 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 a platform called Nexus of nine local NGOs over a year ago which was to demonstrate local leadership, thought leadership, um, and, um, and also an opportunity for bilaterals to meet their localization commitments. Unfortunately, we're not seeing a huge, um, oh, this would have been a great opportunity for donors to say, okay, well, you guys have the right analysis, you have the right understanding, because we understood before everybody else, uh, give you a very um, simple example. When uh, a month and a half, two months ago, we immediately understood that one of the key stakeholders that we had to engage with was religious leaders. We understood that if we don't talk to religious leaders and get them on our side in terms of influencing behavior change and um, propagating the information around social distancing and hand washing and all these other things that uh, the government wanted to actually get the people to do, that we really needed their, the, the religious leaders on our side. So we went out and tried to talk to the religious leaders and we asked them to record some videos and air those videos on radio and TV. Um, and then internationals were coming along during surveys and international agencies and they were like, oh, lo and behold, we have to talk to religious leaders. Religion is very important in a country like Somalia. We're like, yeah, of course, you know, I mean, but that, that level of understanding of the context on how to respond and the speed in which you have to change your strategy. And right now, we've just realized that the infection rate is extremely high. Um, the good news is, is that a lot of people in our, at least anecdotal evidence, is saying that actually the death rate is not that high. And, um, and that it's actually because many people are recovering so easily and so quickly, it's actually reinforced previous uh, beliefs that COVID is actually just a flu, uh, just a cold. So three weeks ago, one month ago, we were seeing maybe more fear, more you know, people more scared, but now it's actually become the complete opposite. So, um, so we, we, now we have to start thinking, okay, what do we do differently? How do we actually maybe now focus and do more targeted kind of support to elderly and immune compromised households? Um, but my point is, is that, you know, uh, the reality the, we knew that local communities, uh, local actors are the closest to the communities and have the best understanding of the context and the best understanding of what is the most appropriate response. And COVID is just laying that very bare and very clearly. Um, and, and I don't see, unfortunately, um, the system, the international system, the donors responding to that, understanding that and appreciating that and actually saying, okay, we need to shift um, our funding strategies and we need to shift our response plans and li start listening to the civil society and start really listening to what they're suggesting to us. We're not really seeing that. And, uh, and that's really um, uh, unfortunate because it's, I think, uh, two months ago, everybody, all of us were saying, okay, maybe COVID presents an opportunity and has really peeled the layers to demonstrate how um, inadequate the current system is, which it is. It has definitely laid that bare, but uh, we were hopeful that we would see a, a change. And, uh, but unfortunately, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, seeing that change right now. Maybe in six months, um, I would have more positive news, but right now I don't. Um, and then, you know, what the situation with INGOs like Oxfam um, and what happened, uh, the recent announcement on the DevEx article, uh, we knew that that was happening. We knew that uh, weeks ago, we've been talking about this on the side as civil society, that um, on the one hand, there's this fear 
um, on the part of local NGOs because actors like Oxfam have been amazing allies on the localization agenda. And um, many of us don't wanna see them leaving these countries. And many of us want, want these international positive alliances, positive solidarity actors um, to, to work with us. On the other hand, um, there's an opportunity that COVID is presenting. And we're also very sad about the fact that people are losing their jobs. That's always a very sad situation. And we don't want that to happen. But at the same time, um, it, is, it does present an opportunity to really reimagine what that new ecosystem looks like and what the INGO new um, way of working means in light of COVID because we are seeing a situation where not just Oxfam, but many INGOs are feeling the financial crunch and the pinch. Um, so I think, yeah, the, so the, 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 the funding crisis in the global north really is forcing INGOs to rethink how um, they function and how they look like. And I think that presents an opportunity for us to extend a hand uh, to the INGO community and say, okay, so if you're really serious about your commitments on localization and shifting power, this is what, the, this is what real solidarity looks like. Invest your resources and your limited resources and funding in these areas in real partnership and letting us lead on the ground in the response instead of being competitors. Of course, the negative consequence of this is that we are worried that the trend is going to be accelerated where a lot of international INGOs are southernizing and nationalizing in the global south and competing with local civil society for the limited resources that exist in the global south because they are seeing an opportunity for fundraising in the Philippines and in India in more middle income countries and they're squeezing out the opportunities for fundraising of local of local civil society the two percent CSR money in India that was meant for civil society is now going to UN if you can imagine UN agencies and INGOs more than to local civil society so it's uh, uh, so this trend, I think, that was very alarming, now might be actually be accelerated because the South may be seen as more of an opportunity to diversify their income source as it depletes in the North. Um, let me stop there. Great. Thank you, Degan. You raised a number of really, really important issues there. And uh, that the whole power shift, and it's something we will revisit in the questions, I'm sure. Thank you very much. We'll now take a pivot to the east and um, introduce our, our colleagues from the Sajaja network and to, to Puji and Dino um, from the Sajaja platform in Indonesia. Let me introduce Dr. Puji Pujiano, who is a senior advisor to the Pujiano Centre, a local CSO based in a village in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Puji has worked for over two decades in disaster risk management and humanitarian response in the UN and ASEAN and was instrumental in developing the Indonesian Disaster Management Act and the ASEAN Regional Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response. Puji currently serves as a chairperson of Indonesia's National Council on Social Welfare, as well as chairman of the Anjali Group of Companies, in, in which capacity he is a member of the United Nations Asia Pacific Sustainable Business Network. Welcome, Fuji. I would also introduce Dino Argianto, who is Oxfam's Indonesian Humanitarian Operation Lead, where he manages the humanitarian portfolio. Dino is a humanitarian practitioner with 15 years experience in emergency relief and development contexts. He has served as disaster management delegate in the North Pacific, Disaster Management Coordinator for the American Red Cross, Accessibility Program Manager for Humanity and Inclusion, and an Urban Planner in Yogyakarta. Dino is passionate about local humanitarian leadership, localization of aid, and equitable partnerships, and is also one of the proponents of the Sajaja Network in Indonesia. Puji, would you like to lead off on introducing the Sajaja Network and how it came about, and the how this, how COVID-19 has impacted on both the setup of Sajaja, uh, but also on localization and leadership within Indonesia. Thank you, Pajit. Thank you, Phil. 
uh, colleagues, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To all of you. Let me start with um, setting the context. Uh, Indonesia, as many of you know, as the country of a thousand islands. Uh, everything in Indonesia is big, I suppose. Right. And um, Ujono Center was, uh, was a privilege to be in a unique position uh, with regard to localization. As two consecutive major natural disasters took place in, in Indonesia in the 2018, government took the decision to shut off the incoming international aid. Right? Uh, largely based on, on probably false confidence that they, the government could handle it. And this put the international players in, in uh, disorientation, clearly. But they also provide very interesting laboratory, if you like, a unique specimen in central Sulawesi in which everything becomes quote unquote localized. So Fujiano Center was privileged to undertake a, a study with the Humanitarian Advisory Group for the first hundred days. We're only getting every few words. You might want to you might want to turn your video off. That's better. Thank you. Puji, go I, ahead. It's off now. Okay. Right. Yep. So, uh, we, we did localization study at the system wide, and then we did the study at the network wide of the Dutch Medical Alliance, and finally at agency wide with Carrier International. So, we have a final perspective of, uh, of that localization now. And then kicks in the, uh, the uh, COVID 19, in which I'm going to request colleagues to show the uh, PowerPoint uh, brief presentation. As we're waiting for that, Indonesia civil society space has been squeezed by uh, the states that are very, very uh, uh, dominating, I suppose. And then uh, the market uh, was also dominating. And lately, we have the military also, also getting into the place, not to mention the fundamentalist narratives of the Muslim uh, uh, you know, uh, persuasion. So civil society is, is there in the corner somewhere. And now uh, the COVID then asserts a new perspective. I think. This is what we see. Initially, we are preparing uh, ourselves for the Asia Pacific Military Conference on Disaster Reduction in Brisbane in June. Phil. But then, uh, when we had our second meeting, this COVID uh, took place. So we thought we quickly repurpose our meeting and broaden the remit to include everybody else. And when we put together this sajaja, as you see in, in, the, in the logo there, we, we just created logo out of uh, a round of coffee on the table. You know? Sajaja means that um, uh, literally mean equivalent, equal or emancipate. Envisioning an Indonesia after COVID that is more open, where the civil society could work, could be partner of the government, and could also be watching uh, uh, the work of the government. We formed this uh, platform to help reduce the effect of the COVID-19 in terms of preventable death, to prevent suffering, and to build the uh, readiness to recover. At the same time, spotlighting the weak and the marginalized among the society. And equally important to take the opportunity to build uh, you know, the basis for future platform for CSOs. Um, and, and then we position ourselves as uh, giving an added value to CSOs and NGOs in terms of information, strategies, and collaborations. And uh, hope to build a better recovery uh, mechanism with government, a mechanism that is open, that is sustained, and so on. So essentially, we put ourselves as a, as a secretariat. Next, please. Uh, in the next slide, uh, colleague, you will see um, that as we move on to the 10th uh, week now, we already have um, 23 national networks joining us. Uh, that is uh, from the Red Cross to the uh, Muslim uh, faith base to uh, Christian services to the environment, uh, legal aids public health, you name it. Uh, 
So 23 uh, uh, national networks are joining in. We have 34 provincial, which is sub-national secretariat or focal points, and 600 sub-national NGOs are on the network. So we thought this is, this is quite something in 10 weeks. We thought at this point now, our network has broadened the conversation. It allowed people to talk more from cross sectors. I think we have a better information across and we thought we are stronger in terms of, you know, we, we are negotiating with the government the other day. And also we're talking on, on a deeper, uh, just to give a taste of what the Jajar is all about. And then uh, I'll pass it on to Dino to give some highlight on what's the impact of the uh, COVID in general. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I just would like to lead the read uh, on the reflection on COVID. Of course, then COVID has a uh, deep and long-lasting adverse impact to the uh, where we are now. The pandemic is really still indiscriminately. The poor, poor weak, and marginalized also is uh, impacted the most. And uh, as they can uh, mention early, that is fast changing uh, context, uh, if for from an emergency to long-term uh, recovery. But we also see that a comprehensive response can be done. Yeah? The pandemic changed the life of uh, all segments of society, how we work, how we interact, and how we uh, communicate. Yeah? There is also uh, acknowledge that uh, it's not only the government need to tackle but also multi-sector multi-layers etc and we see that uh gso and also ngos has avenue that can cater all sector and scope and that's where we see the positive side of this pandemic is as a role of gso to support uh the government yeah what happened in indonesia uh we seen that uh uh, even though uh, participation from uh, GSO is already there, but it's uh, still uh, we need to see uh, some intervention or some uh, co collaboration uh, amongst GSO is required to ensure that uh, we can uh, serve the most because we have uh, capacities we have competencies, and the most important thing is we have clients, the community itself, yeah, spread out uh, across uh, countries. There is uh, several platform available, but we didn't see multi-layer, multi-sector is there. So that's why uh, Sejajar is uh, exist, and we try to fill uh, the gap and complementarity uh, with other uh, uh, platform. We try to encourage uh, the existing platform like the disaster risk platform in one province, etc. that's uh, more active. And then we suggest serve as supermarket. What they need, what they support, we can offer the services to them, not vice versa. So I guess that's the reflection on COVID. And of course, the global pandemic uh, with all those limitations, uh, international funding is limited. Uh, the in-country uh, contribution is really, uh, really changing. Eh? I'm just like we, we can see the changing. Eh? So uh, with this organization, with this uh, contribution is also uh, that much. So we can be able to utilize, mobilize the resources. And in the context of Indonesia, uh, the community level. Uh, response led by local leaders like smallest uh, neighborhood unit is really significant and all over a country and it is something that we see as a uh, positive side uh, of the pandemic that can uh, robust the or accelerate uh, the localization I offer to you Kuji. Uh, th thank you Dino um, could you move to the next slide please Right, uh, on, on, on the next slide, colleagues, I will share with you uh, and, and respond to the, the last question and how this COVID-19, uh, no, before that one, the impact on leadership, please, impact the leadership. 
as I mentioned in the opening, Indonesia is a country with uh, with this uh, you know uh, space for civil society. We started with weekly webinars, really. Uh, every week we we pick up uh, issues and have webinars attended by 200 to 300 NGOs throughout Indonesia, and we form it up to become this platform. But how does it change the dynamic dynamic of leadership? It took us three separate meetings with government, with the presidential office, the chair of the uh, COVID task force, and so on. To cut the long story short, last week, finally we clinched it. We had an official meeting under the national task force where the Sajajar uh, national networks and provincial uh, colleagues are meeting formally with the national task force and their provincial counterparts. And we also have access to the ministers, to the, the top decision makers in the country in the webinars and on personal spaces. So I think as benign as it is, we are renegotiating the power of the government with regard to humanitarian action. With regard to international actors, we would like to echo what Degan was saying, as the international community are laying low and the effect of leadership only in so far to the national clusters. What we did was, we positioned the international actors as resources to local NGOs in our network. Tomorrow, in fact, I'm going to have uh, meeting number six, if I'm not mistaken, with, uh, with clusters. And we will ask them to tell us what kind of products and services they would like to offer. And as you know, said, this is like a supermarket. And local NGOs can pick and choose what they need from what was being offered. And uh, in our trainings, we brought in international players to tell us what is it they can do with us. For example, with regard to financial crisis and, 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 and funding uh, shortage. And we, we took charge um, uh, training for our colleagues and finally uh, going out to the region, including having conversations with you now. Next week, we're going to have, uh, we will be hosting meeting with ASEAN. And uh, yesterday, we had a meeting with the uh, Humanitarian Leadership Practice Group. On that, I think my last message in this particular conversation is that I'm, I'm very pleased that Humanitarian Advisory Group has been, you know, gracefully with us, uh, uh, willing to repurpose their ongoing project with us to support this network. And I guess this calling is, is to all other international community colleagues. If you don't use this network, we will not be useful. So I, I will end it there, Phil, uh, for the interest of time. We'll share other information later. So sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paji. Thank you, Dino. Very interesting. And I do like that idea of having an INGO supermarket about how they, what, where the, in, where the local organisations can go and pick and choose. That sounds like a great idea. Finally, we swing a little bit further east and a little bit south. And I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce Siali. Siali Ilalahia is the Executive Director of the Pacific Islands Association of Non-Government Organisations, PANGO, based in Fiji. Siali is a Tongan civil society leader, women's advocate and activist. As the Executive Director of PANGO, Siali represents the interests of Pacific civil society in a range of regional and international forums. Through her work with Piango and several coalitions and organisations in Tonga, Ziali has been engaged in joint Piango Humanitarian Advisory Group research on diverse and inclusive humanitarian leadership and measuring localisation in several Pacific Island countries. Ziali was previously the Executive Director of the Civil Society Forum of Tonga. So Ziali, what are, what are your reflections on COVID? and its impact on localization and leadership in the Pacific region. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, before I start, I would like to um, just echo the, the um, acknowledging of the land of, of, uh, of our respective countries. Uh, of, of all of us from the panelists uh, uh, as well as the participants, um, the values and their traditions and um, uh, things that we often uh, recognize that uh, when it comes to 
um, COVID-19 or any cyclones or any disaster, uh, oftentimes that's where we are uh, testing our faith and our spirituality, uh, things that we believe. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, uh, a good start to acknowledge that. Uh, before I, I, I share my reflections, uh, there are uh, several other civil society organizations in the region, uh, in the Pacific region to be specific, who are doing great work in, in humanitarian response. Uh, we also have international um, organizations that are, um, have uh, set up offices in Fiji in particular because of our uh, Fiji is like our hub um, uh, in, in, our, in our Pacific region. But I think what's different about Piango because we are a network of um, umbrella NGOs in 24 countries and territories in the Pacific. So we were fortunate that when uh, COVID-19 hit the Pacific um, and, and our government uh, immediately um, put precautionary measures like state of emergencies, lockdown, uh, Piango, uh, we were, we were uh, like other NGOs, uh, we closed our office, we work from home, uh, but then the amazing thing is that our members in countries continue to work. And I can uh, resonate very well with uh, uh, sharing from Digon from, uh, from Kenya and Somalia about the interesting role that civil society at the national level. Uh, I, I suppose the, the, the amazing thing is that it's, there is no other, there's no other alternative for them. Yeah, while all of the other NGOs are, uh, are negotiating with their, with their centre and wherever their, their, their head office is to get them out of the country, um, we, we don't see that as any alternative options for our locals. Yeah, the only, the only option that is left for them is that find out what is it that they need to do to pick up, to make sure that our our communities are well informed. Some of our some of our civil society in country they reach out to government, they reach out to uh, Ministry of Health in particular to make sure that the uh, uh, medical information about COVID uh, is being delivered. Uh, if if it's not being available, knowing that access to internet is expensive, um, you know TV. Some of our informal settlement don't even have electricity. How do we make sure that we had those information shared? One of the interesting things that has been um, uh, coming out in my own observation is that COVID-19 is not actually the enemy. It just exposed a lot of uh, uh, things that we had seen in our Pacific government in particular, some of our countries that we have shifted our priorities. Uh, before COVID-19, we have already shifted our priorities from, from social uh, 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 interest to economic uh, uh, model. Yeah? And so when we, when we had that shift, we had seen our government uh, doing a whole lot of, uh, of uh, reform in our public service. Yeah? And then we had seen uh, uh, cut in terms of um, of a number of, of of jobs within the public sector, our health, for example, our education system, for example, yeah. And so when COVID nineteen, it's just exposing some of those priority that has changed in the in 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 the years, uh, and then we recognize that this is the time when we are being tested about our social protections that supposed to be already in place. So COVID-19 is just coming to uh, challenge uh, that system that, that has shifted uh, and, and it's been shifted away from, from, from the interests of, of people. Yeah? And so we also have seen COVID-19 expose the whole uh, reliance and the whole resilience of our community in the Pacific, where our resilience is based on our natural resources, uh, everyone, when the lockdown happened, they go farming. Yeah? When everyone is losing jobs, they go fishing. When everyone is losing jobs, they go into handicrafts. 
something that is producing product that it, it doesn't value um, the trade in the WTO uh, sphere, but it is value in terms of exchange within your own community. Yeah, and then we see government leadership automatically they they close their borders they um, uh, put in state of emergencies yeah but then we started to see the imbalances of is it about safety or is it about security yeah because if it's about safety you're not gonna lock out people for breaking curfew you you'll probably just change them to go home yeah? but we have stack of cases where people are being uh, taken to court for breaking curfew. Yeah? And so those are the things that it's, it's, it's just tested the intellectual capacity of our population and our society when we are being threatened by something like COVID-19. The other point that I have seen the interesting observation is how four of our countries in the Pacific also had a cyclone. While we are dealing with COVID, there was a cyclone coming through, category four. And it's devastating Vanuatu, uh, Solomon Islands, Tonga, and Fiji. And we had seen that because COVID, we, we had not had system in place or mechanisms in place that people were not um, uh, familiar with how to respond. And so out of, out of uncertainty, they, they just don't know how to, how to deal with it. But then compare that to the cyclone because they, they had cyclone every day in the Pacific. So people already know how to deal with, but then, the, but then you see our government confusing the two in terms of not really know how do you deal with one over the other. Yeah, and so we see a lot of the conversation in country that civil society has been leading is calling on government to say this is not just a health issue yeah this is not just a health uh, pandemic uh, when you go and have awareness program to communities that doesn't have electricity that doesn't have clean water because their informal settlement doesn't allow them to have those infrastructure in place and then you give the the whole message to wash your hand 20 times or how many times you want it you know and, 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 and those are the things is that, that we need to question, is that if you want to have a system that can help your community respond to pandemic like COVID-19, it's, it's not going to be like uh, 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 just something that you do today. It has to go back to the system and make sure that you tested your priorities. Is it still valid to continue putting money and economic model um, uh, above your, 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 your people, above your, your environment, above your natural resources that becomes your, your, your fallback or your default to your communities. But then amazingly, I think the, the, the thing for us now is to, if we want to analyze of how we can build back better, is to look deeper than just the political leadership and the government leadership and look into the communities because the amazing thing is that there are governance, there are traditional system that community are just like automatically in their response and they're not gonna go in anywhere, are just, just trigger, yeah? And then you see, um, you know, the church leaders, you see uh, the traditional leaders, you see they, they don't wait your government say, don't come into our community. They just said, lockdown. We initiate our own police, community policing, and just saying, screen people from coming in in terms of uh, you know, asking them, why are you coming to our community? So, so you see those kind of, of informal system pull in that, that is uh, helping our community uh, uh, reinforce that there are systems in place that we have not really, uh, I think we have been over the years have, have moved away from. Through the, through the work of, um, of the Humanitarian Advisory Group with Piango, we had been able to have conversations and we had come up with key uh, principles 
that we define if we want to say local, locally led um, humanitarian localization, what does that mean? Yeah, and then we have principles like partnership, leadership, coordination, uh, policy influence, capacity, and funding. Yeah, and so we had been in those four countries that were hit by the cyclone, use that to say, let's assess and see how can we track those changes. It was an early stage before the COVID-19, but it has given us like a framework to start having this um, localization baseline uh, that we had done with HAG to help our civil society in country start to look into how can we measure. Uh, and, and, and I think that's two areas that I see that is now very critical for, for the role of civil society for us to ask now. And that is that we have to make sure that we are starting the conversation around shifting the power. Yeah. And we had, uh, I'm not going to repeat some of that because the, the previous uh, presenter had really covered it quite well. But I would like to, to, to pose the thinking in terms of the critical role of funding uh, in terms of localization is still not there. You know, we have not seen anything shifted. We still, we still see Australia, for example, putting their money into an Australian NGO so that it still come back to us. And it, of course, questioned the whole um, capacity of civil society in our region uh, on due diligence and all of that accountability, which is a good thing because we need to recognize those things. But the moment you are not giving that fund and that funding still come from a, a, a country that the money still expect us to have a logo, yeah? It still expect us to have a, a, a kangaroo or something to go with it. It, it, it still doesn't shift the, the power because as soon as we get that with the string attached, we become the poor, they become the rich. We become the vulnerable, they become the, yeah? So the dynamic still, still doesn't make any changes. So if we are to look into how we build this, uh, come out of this uh, COVID-19, the whole humanitarian architecture has to change, yeah? It really has to change the way we see how we manage our money and, and how we see uh, the dynamics of, of trusting. And I think when you, when you say about shifting the power or, 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 or is it just the risk? I think it has to be both. Yeah. It has to be a shared the power and share the risk because automatically when you are uh, giving money away to an organization that you have to expect a receipt or expect a report or something, that's sharing the risk. Yeah. But, but if we don't, if we're not, if we're not willing to share that, and willing to, to have that risk, then I don't think that we are going to be uh, going far of doing something new yeah, in this context. The last point I want to make at uh, uh, this point is that we have been, there are certain, um, certain disaster that, that we avoid, we have been avoiding. Yeah? And those are, the disasters that related to sovereignty of some of our countries in the Pacific. And we had seen that the sad side of it is that COVID-19 has, has posed and make it quite interesting to observe that some of the countries in our region that has, uh, has, has cases, positive cases, majority of our Pacific, and I think this is where, where it's, it's uh, become one of the nice things of being away from everywhere and, and, and being distanced is that you, you seem to have a small population, you can just have a small uh, economy, you can just decide to shut down and, and, and it's easier. Yeah, doesn't have to have the complexity of looking into what does that mean to the economy? What does that mean to all? So, so we, were, we were quite um, fortunate to still have uh, our, some of most of our countries in the region, in the Pacific, free of virus, of, of corona. But if you have a look into the countries that, that have cases, yeah, most of those countries are still under the territories of, of a bigger power. Yeah? And so it does influence the, 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 
the opportunity for that particular country to make the decisions whether to shut down their borders, um, you know, stop plane from coming sure. in. Yeah. And so this is where it is quite interesting to have that, that balance. If we are to do things differently this time, maybe it's about time that we talk about those other disasters that mm -hmm. we don't talk about. Yeah. Sure. Because it's, it's like that we are, we are, we are happy to talk about uh, COVID-19, we are happy to talk about uh, TC Herald, we are happy, but when it comes to difficult discussions around the well-being of our people in our Pacific, we shy away from some of those things. But I think it, it's, it's become the safety conversation of yeah. everyone, including sure. um, other countries that are still struggle in terms of freedom. Uh, and I think I just want to put it out there as a different conversation, maybe. Uh, but it's, we are talking about hashtag no safe space. Maybe it's about uh, time that we start uh, uh, cracking that and have some, some discussions around that, uh, I feel well, particularly for Absolutely. our region. Sure. Thank you, Siali. And I couldn't agree more. Those, those difficult questions underpin everything else that goes on and they certainly need to be addressed. And I don't think it's just in the Pacific, but in a number of places, those, those questions need to be addressed, absolutely. So I want to uh, we, we thank you for that. I want to thank all our panelists for, for their overviews of their particular regions. And, and the thing that has come out to me is that there are many system similarities, but contextual particularities. So, which I think is, is a really interesting thought to go through. So now we're going to move on to the Q&A section of our webinar. And we're going to first ask our panelists a question each that we, as we mentioned, that we received through the registration process and during the webinar. Um, and, and really we're interested in exploring what is of key importance to the participants. And I know for me, and I was just thinking then that for me, this has felt like a really nice chat, a, a, a really personal chat with, with colleagues that are really, really, good and know their, know their things well, but it's just we're 212 people looking over our shoulder, which is very interesting. So first question is to Degan. Degan, INGOs are reconsidering strategic directions, and you mentioned this in, in your, in, when you were talking, and there's been lots of staff cuts, especially in the context of the pandemic. How should local, national and international actors be working together to, to address the uh, pandemic impacts? And secondly, what are the opportunities for complementarity? Dagan. Yeah, I think, I think it depends. Every context is different. South Sudan is gonna be different than, than uh, Indonesia, for instance. Um, but generally, I think that the response on the ground uh, should be led by local actors. Um, and there shouldn't be uh, a competition for funding. And there should be opportunities and incentives that actually INGOs themselves create to allow for their donors, their back donors to, I mean, well, this is one of the things that really uh, makes me angry when I hear an INGO saying, we've been working with these partners for 20 years, 30 years in this country. And I'm like, well, okay, that's not something of pride. That's actually a sign of failure. If you've been with the same partner for 20 years and you haven't graduated them out of your needs and being you know, basically subcontractor to you and you haven't developed their system so that then they now can get access directly to different funding. That should, be the, that should be the goal of every INGO is how do I support my partner to not only lead the response, but where I become irrelevant and I'm no longer needed as intermediary. But that means then we, as INGOs, we have to ask the question about our own existence, our, our future existence and our relevance in the ecosystem. And are we willing to downsize? Are we willing to be, instead of a multi-billion dollar, four, three, two billion dollar INGO, are we willing to, to be a smaller 50 million, 100 million dollar INGO working with a less footprint? Um, so those are the real questions that the boards and the CEOs of the INGOs really need to be grappling with is, um, 
And, and I think that has to be the way. If we're going to localize, it, it, it's not complementary. You can't say we're going to really be serious about localization at the same time our business. You just cut out the Degan, you this might model switch is it. fully yep. 100% around neo-colonial every country and every district every district of that country so that to me is uh that to me is one of the key first challenges that ingos need to really be reflecting on and answer for themselves do you think that that is happening within the boardrooms of ingos or do you think there's going to be a a, a plan to hopefully go back to as near to normal as possible I think there are some that are struggling with this, like Oxfam, I think has that intention and that desire. I'm not really confident in all the tactics on how to implement that strategy, uh, but others are, I don't think are really, um, I think they see localization as a serious threat to their business model. And they're only thinking about how to stay as big as possible and figure out other alternatives to fundraising like the global South. So I think it's a mixed bag, but I think majority are really not at that level as if yet. Sorry, my son keeps coming in and out of me. <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is for Puji and Dino. What are the challenges and opportunities for local and national actors like like Sajaja in responding to COVID? How have international partners been supporting the establishment of civil society platforms like Sajaja? Could this work in other countries? And a second or third or fourth question. Oh, no, let's answer those ones first. So how have opportunities for local and national actors like Sajaja in responding to COVID, how have the international partners been supporting the establishment of civil society and do you think it could work elsewhere? Puji, Dino, and if you could turn on your videos if you can, that would be great. You know, let, let me try to respond to that. Well, as I said earlier, hello? Yes, we can hear you, Puji. Yes, loud and clear. Yes, as I said earlier, as the uh, in uh, amidst the uh, uh, COVID uh, assault, the local NGOs have been turning inward, if that's the correct way. We are turning into the faith-based funding, the um, the the Muslim zakat funding, which is huge uh, uh, amount. We gather ourselves and we teach each other of how to tap into government projects. In fact. Uh, we spoke to the ministers and others and tell us which part we can work with you. We do that. And then uh, we talk to um, INGOs, as I said earlier, as our resources, rather than the one that dictate the game. We are the one now to, to set the pace. Uh, we also tap into each other. For example, uh, there has been proposals uh, among local NGOs that sent to us here in Jakarta at the Sajaja, and we helped them to shape the proposal and said, we're all behind you and have uh, the higher uh, bargaining position, if you like. So I think that's how the localization in practice happening here uh, in, uh, in amidst the COVID. I think the opportunity is there. The challenge is always here. The challenge is, Phil, if we have this network in place for 10 weeks now, Yes. and we're not utilize, uh, utilizing it, I think the credibility will go down the drain quickly because this is not the first by far. It has been several initiatives like this. Uh, so we need to, to make use of it. Uh, I've been asking colleagues from international community, if you want to see it happen, you need to work with us. We need to put credible proposition. Uh, you need to follow the follow suit the humanitarian advisory group and then and, and have faith and allow us to fail. Allow us to take the risk. You know, maybe the risk is worth it. This is maybe the new normal, Phil. This is how we work from now onward. Yeah. So I, th I sure. think that that's, it should work in other countries too, because our proposition is not complicated. It's very simple. Let's just meet on a regular basis. Let's have contact point. Let's get everyone on the same uh, contact list. Uh, and mm -hmm. every, everything will go from there. 
Uh, do you know? You like to add anything? Yes, I guess uh, just to add uh, this uh, changing context uh, give us also the new booking for sure. I mean, it's like it doesn't mean from, for instance, like the perspective of INGO like Oxfam, we see this kind of uh, uh, the new working is opportunity for us to push up the uh, localization because uh, uh, those who are working in the field is actually the TSOs, uh, the community itself, and the local NGOs. Yeah, because most of us, because like uh, mentioned by Dickon earlier, that uh, in regard of the duty of care of the staff, we we working remotely to provide assistance, to do monitoring, etc. Yeah, so it is can be seen as a uh, opportunity for local actors to uh, be more significant, take, uh, taking the uh, leadership. But uh, for INGO, we can use it uh, this kind of way of working because uh, we also face some uh, limitation in terms of uh, uh, due to the changing in uh, financial uh, landscape, etc., and the way of the working. So we can use this as a platform. Like Sajajar is a, a good uh, platform to reach out, uh, even not only our partners, existing partners, but we can reach out from the grassroots level to help improve how they work in the uh, field in responding uh, the COVID. We can add, provide added value by pro providing technical assistance, remote assistance, uh, we can also uh, help improve their, the way of the working by answering the uh, uh, global uh, SOP, something like that is in it. For instance, like uh, during the COVID, we also help out how the distribution should be in respect of social distancing and also uh, physical distancing, something like that. It is something that we offer in Sejajar. And in... Uh, responding to your questions, how the judger can be replicated, I guess it is the time because most of the countries also face the same uh, obstacles in this pandemic uh, uh, COVID-19. We couldn't be able uh, to uh, go out uh, to the field because uh, the restriction of the government, but in, in regard to funding, we also have some limitation. Having this kind of uh, platform online platform, we can also utilize this as uh, a tools or platform to help out the community to reach out to the community by providing services and guidance, remote assistance, etc. Et and mm -hmm. it can be in line with the, uh, the, our strategy, for instance, like also strategy, we're trying to uh, also boost up the location. For instance, like Central Sulawesi, we already uh, provide like 80% of the funding goes to the local partners. Yeah, but it is not only uh, not happen in uh, uh, overnight. Yeah, there is a step that we mm -hmm. can uh, uh, we 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 setting up for for them to uh, take that significant role in in terms of uh, decision, but also in terms of uh, funding that they may need. We also mm -hmm. trying to engage. Uh, um, it's like direct, uh, we also facilitate like direct uh, funding as well. Like uh, DFAT already uh, implement these things as well uh, to our lo uh, local partners. But of course, Oxfam will be kind of a uh, guarantor. But the money goes to them 100% for DFAT money. Something like that. This is something that we, we see that this pandemic, uh, this situation can be seen as a positive way in terms of uh, boosting localization and accelerating localization. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you, Dino. Thank you, Pudji. A question for Siali. Do you think that how governments and, and national civil society responded to Tropical Cyclone Harold during the COVID-19, is that going to become the new normal, do you think, in the Pacific? Thank you, Phil. Uh, I, think, I think we have, we have to to separate uh, uh, the two, uh, because when it comes to uh, cyclone, uh, there are already mechanisms, as I said earlier, in place um, that allow the engagement of civil society uh, with government. 
uh, for, for the pandemic like COVID-19, uh, it's a totally shut down. Yeah. And then you started to see uh, the level of education in terms of how people uh, have a sense of separating whether it's a, um, a fake news or is it a, a real news or how do you deal with the uh, human right issue when you are discriminating certain groups because they are more exposed to having the disease or uh, things like that. But I think what I, what I also have to to, um, to respond to your questions, uh, I feel is that it touched to the core of how our government is running. And we already see that if we are not careful, we will lose the principle of democracy, the transparency, the accountability. That is something that civil society need to keep on uh, uh, raising. Yeah, uh, and, and, and a lot of our countries in the region uh, are just about to go into their next election, for example, yeah, and you start already seeing uh, the 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 you know less transparent in terms of how mm -hmm. funds are being managed uh, at the same time, and I think I would like to also touch into your further your earlier questions about where does the role of international NGOs and, and, mm -hmm. and local civil society yep. in this particular situation. Uh, international NGOs are out because they are locked down. Yeah, so yeah. It, the localization agenda becomes between civil society and their own government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you start seeing the same same issue that there are lack of transparency in the process, and they are not, and then they are giving the funds to manage. And the first thing that they do, those people that lose their job, you go to your retirement scheme. We mm -hmm. put some money there, but but hang on, that's their money anyway. Supposed to be their own money. How, yeah. how different is that? Or are they put into the funds, into the, the bank and said, small farmers, you go to the bank and talk to them. And then we still see the inequality because for small farmers, when you go to a bank system, you have to go have a, a credit uh, uh, as, um, uh, details. You have to have a relationship with the bank. So you will end it up uh, marginalizing the groups that you are supposed to be supporting just because you are putting it into a system that has failed in the first place. So we have not seen anything change in terms of the structures, in terms of how we see things being responded. So if, you, if you're, you're questioning in terms of, is this the new norm? I hope it's not because we haven't seen anything change until we have something that is concretely changed in the whole system. And that can only be done by bringing everyone, mm -hmm. international NGOs, civil society, our community, our health workers, our teachers, our students in our government together, our local leaders, our churches, and have a conversation in how, because there, there is a role for everyone. And so, I always find, the, I always find the, the conversation about international NGOs and, and local NGOs in the agenda of humanitarian localization as a self-determination conversation, mm -hmm. yeah? Because we had not have seen them building our capacity to take the leadership role. And now, now there's a whole lot of pushback, but actually there is a role for everyone. It's just that there are certain stages of that journey that you have to be one driving, one have to be in the uh, back seat. And then in a certain situation, one will have to change the role. And, and our, our experience working with HAG in particular is one that we have always been cherished because we have seemed to come to in a, a partnership conversation before we even started up. And we have seen that 18 months we managed to have our, our four baseline uh, research in our, in our four countries in the region. Phil, if that was left to us, I think we only have like half a page now fill up but because they bring in their different skills so that the skill set does change, yeah? As we go in, as we say, so the whole dynamics of power and shifting has to be also shifted at certain situation. And that's where a role of everyone can come in. Okay. Thank you very much, Siali. Great answer. And, and I couldn't agree more with all of you about that. And the one thing that I would like to add, and I would have liked to ask you, but we're running out of time, is the role of diaspora 
in, in all of that because a strong Pacific diaspora um, in Australia and New Zealand and I know they normally get involved in some way, shape or form. Anyway, we've come to the last 14, 15 minutes, um, 14 minutes, 13 minutes. So I would like to ask the panellists just a quick two minutes each on for a final remark and so that we end on a on a forward focused note on thinking about the positives for the future the question i'd like to ask each of you to spend a couple of minutes on is what changes do you hope to see in the humanitarian system in the near future uh Degans, we'll start with you Yeah, um, I think the I think first of all, um, we need to use this opportunity as civil society to organize ourselves. We we started that process with the NIR network. Um, it's happening at the national level with Sajaja and with Nexus in Somalia. Um, it's happening all over the global south. I think that this is, we can't be waiting for the international system to change. We have to be leading in demonstrating and demanding and developing the ecosystem for, for what that change looks like, especially at the national level and especially using our um, national governments as allies. Um, what the Indonesian government did with the last uh, tsunami in terms of saying that, you know, response has to be led by the government and civil society and no international presence was excellent. Uh, Asia is far more ahead of us than, than, what, than us in Africa. And we need to be using those opportunities to expand that global south to south exchanges with the governments and get them to really sub be allies on the localization agenda. And I think that's how you change it. You, 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 we really need to start saying, we own this space, we are civil society, this, these are our countries. And how do we get our, the, our governments as allies and how do we now start constructing what that new rea reality should look like? Second thing is building on this issue of local philanthropy. Um, there is uh, a great network of uh, community foundations that, um, that have existed uh, for many, many years, very strong. We need to build on, on that and capitalize on the opportunities for fundraising in our own countries, whether it's zakat, whether it's sadaqa, charitable giving, whatever. There's a quite a lot of money in the global south and we need to professionalize this, organize it, and you do it at large scale so that we basically start taking the space that's currently empty that INGOs are coming into and taking. Um, there is a huge opportunity. They see it and they're coming into our countries, but we should be thinking about how do we create national funds that have a great brand that are transparent and accountable and relatable to the local population so that these funds can compete with the likes of these international brands. So I think th that's, those are the two things. Then there's obviously yeah. other barriers around due diligence, other barriers around other kind of with the ecosystem that currently exists that's internationally led. And there's other solutions to those barriers. But I think now we need to stay, start thinking about what we can do as, as the global South, rather than waiting for the global North to respond to our demands. Sure, fantastic. Thank you, Degan. Puji, what would you see as some concrete examples that would help move the conversation forward? Well, I think uh, for Sajajar, we need to, to just continue what we have just started. Um, we have in our network local NGO that has become international in a sense that they are reaching out to help other countries. This is on the pretext that Indonesia was declared as a middle income country where the aid structure even with Australia has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. It brings somehow a confidence to some of our colleagues amongst DSOs that would step out, uh, you know, like Humanitarian Alliance of Indonesia helping Myanmar, helping other countries mm -hmm. and so on. Sure. And uh, we see that as a, uh, hopefully not the same evil as we have seen before, <laughs> but although some colleagues say, oh, now we're seeing a brown, uh, you know, NGOs running around. 
but mm-hmm. uh, this, this are the initial, you know, teetering problem that we have, but I think we can handle it. So yes, uh, tapping local uh, potentials among ourselves, that will be uh, uh, the flavor of the month. And echoing what Degan was saying, building alliance with government to a certain uh, segment of work, but remain critical and then saying upfront to the government, look, at some point we need to advocate some agenda, at some point we need to, to, to be critical of you, allow us to do that. That's, uh, that, that's one. Number two is uh, we try to find friends uh, around in ASEAN. We have established very robust ASEAN. Whatever people say about ASEAN, I think that that's the only thing we have in the neighborhood. Uh, we found that talking to colleagues in the Philippines and in Myanmar and other places would also bring the energy across uh, and also build our collective confidence uh, and friends that localization that way. And the third one is invest really on the documentation, on uh, upgrading the information and experience to become knowledge. And that sent with the Umetra Advisory Group, uh, Puchino Center is investing on the blueprint projects, which is trying to turn or turn the table around instead of waiting for the international reform to take place. We just have a look at uh, our own, uh, you know, house and see which parts are really moving to what directions, and how uh, the system is manifesting uh, right under our eyes here, and invest on those uh, nodes of changes. So these are three things. Uh, one is tapping and yep. cultivating our, our internal colleagues. Number two, build friendship in the region, and number three, elevate the experience into knowledge and make it known uh, to all the way to Ethiopia and uh, to Kenya, if need be. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Fiji. Sure. Thank you, Fiji. Dino, quickly, anything you'd add to that? Yes, I just would like to add uh, one, one thing. Uh, I mean, like uh, having a, a wider allies, uh, not only in the, your country specific, but also learning from others uh, to convince the uh, confessional donor and also the uh, NGO partners is also important. And mm-hmm. while you also need to uh, strengthen the accountability, etc., as a barrier for localization of it, I guess that's the the, the most cr- critical things. If we would like to step ahead, uh, having these experiences, uh, I'm like the COVID-19 uh, experiences on localization, to stepping forward uh, since. Uh, all of us, all of uh, partners now is trying to be relevant to the context. INGO also trying to be relevant in the context with the short of, shortfall of, of, of funding, uh, the humanitarian landscape is different, uh, the localization is growing, etc. So be relevant, uh, be agile as well to the, the context and also be humble, of course, as like INGO. We, we, we need to also see, not only think about, uh, I mean, it's like, uh, I also see uh, sa, uh, a feedback on uh, INGO might my, my think that need to grow uh, bigger, but we need to also think that uh, growing bigger is, it doesn't mean anything. Like they can mention that having like uh, more than 10 years experiences in country, it doesn't mean uh, it is your achievement. It is totally wrong perspective. So we need to see this as opportunity for me uh, to also reflect uh, ourselves to the mirror that I NGO, the institutional donor, need to also be fit, be agile, be relevant to this context. So, so and also, for instance, like uh, if we talk about localization, always we we forgot uh, to bring the locals in the uh, discussion. We need to uh, provide more uh, space for them to speak up, to voice, and uh, to, to find a solution. How? I guess that's all. Sure, fantastic. Thank you, Dino. Tiali, any, what would you like to see, concrete example you would like to see? Maybe because we will not be able to change the world, but we can change certain things about how we do mm-hmm. things. Uh, and for civil society, the exciting side of things that we see is that this is an opportunity to become innovation. Mm-hmm. Yeah? And because like 
Piango, for example, we, are, we have been around building institutions. We have certain rules that has uh, allow us to challenge things with our government in, in different ways. Uh, but we had not, and, and this is an opportunity for us to look at the groups that are doing work around uh, their, their social movements. Yeah? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and interesting enough that now we reflect on that, a lot of our young people are around that grouping. Yeah? So how do yeah. we see this as an opportunity to find ways of bringing the issue in? At the same time, we know that our government still want to see policy on piece of paper. So how can we start looking at perhaps COVID-19 is allowing us a little bit more on, on trying to make sense of international NGOs, maybe at this stage, mm -hmm. but find ways of looking within our local system. Right now, I think we have been complaining about government, but maybe they don't know how the solutions look like. And maybe this is where we need to bring people to say, let's try things out and see what a solution may be and propose to government and, and ask the donors to, to know that sharing the risk means that you, that you may disappoint people if you change the way you do things. And I would like to post that as let's find the solutions. We have had very interesting learning from cyclones and so many things like that. Unfortunately, we see every time there is a disaster coming through, we are all surprised and do things just like again and again and again. So where are those learnings? And I think this is where I would like to finish off by saying, bring those learnings and build something new, find solutions. We may find that that solution may fail, but, but you know, what else can we do? But finding way in adapting to new change would probably be the exciting at the same time, that could mm -hmm. be what we need to find out together and have Fantastic. spaces for people to come together and do that. Thank you, sure. everyone. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Siali. Thank you for those wonderful, wonderful answers. I'd like to thank, um, the, the two things I take out of that is yes, I think it's great to see civil society and, and, and their adherents taking the lead on that change, which I think is really important and searching for those answers and, and searching for those opportunities to present answers and, and present alternatives, which I think is fantastic. Great takeaways from all of this. I just wanted to, to thank all our speakers. So Degan, Fuji, Dino and, and Siali, that has been absolutely outstanding. Thank you very much. I also want to thank the co-hosts um, for all their time and energy and just to name a few, Jennifer, Josie, Disya, Sonia, Liz, Lizzie, um, Vicky, um, I don't think I've missed anybody else out, but thank you one and all for pulling this all together and, and being behind the scenes and, and collating everything. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your participation in all of this. And it's fantastic to still see so many engaged in this after, after all this time. And we're looking for feedback and a feedback survey, which will take you about two or three minutes, I believe, will be in your inbox tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. And just a reminder, we're doing all this again in a month's time. So if you want to save the date, Thursday, the 18th of June, and it will be taking a health focus and the impact of COVID-19 on health. So from me, Phil Connors, I just want to thank you all for participating. Thank you, participants, and thank you, attendees, for coming along. It's been great to be here. Thank you, speakers, and thank you, support teams and, and all the co-hosts. It has made my job so much easier and I really look forward to carrying on this conversation over the coming months. Thank you all and stay well, stay safe. See you in a month's time.